So the first principle that I'd probably like to introduce is the principle of preclusion. So. As it relates to the soul. Right. Yeah. Would you like and, to And tell? if we just explain to people that these principles are just names of given things, they're not, you know, they're not something, they're just labels that I've given to a certain type of understanding. And if we can describe the understanding, then they'll be able to associate the label with the understanding. Mm. Okay. Mm. So would you like to describe what preclusion is? Yeah, preclusion is the is the principle, and it's uh, it's based upon this basic premise about how the soul operates and how God created the soul. God created the soul so that so that truth and error cannot exist in it at the same time. So preclusion is this basic understanding that while truth exists on a certain subject inside the soul, then an error on that same subject inside the soul cannot exist, and. And the same applies with errors. While an error exists within the soul on, on a certain subject, at the same time, truth cannot exist on that same subject. It precludes truth from existing. So, so error and truth that exist in the soul are independent of, of each other in a way that there's the, truth and error cannot exist on the same subject at, at the same time in the same soul. And, uh, and so this, this can help us a lot if we understand this, if we understand that that, that is the case. So what, what I feel preclusion helps us do is to understand that while I might have certain beliefs in my mind, it doesn't necessarily mean that I've entered my soul because the entering into the soul of that particular belief will de depend upon whether error or truth already exists in the soul about that particular thing. And so the error inside of my soul precludes the truth from existing if, it, if the error already exists in the soul. So this is about the state or the condition of the soul right now. It's not about some future state or how change happens or any of those things. It's really a statement about what is the state of my soul right in this moment the state of my soul right at this moment on, on a particular issue or subject. This is my state. While error exists inside of my soul on that subject, it's impossible, no matter how much I think it's possible, it's impossible for truth inside of my soul to exist on the same subject. So that could be any kind of feeling or belief? Yes, yeah, so it relates to beliefs, it relates to feelings, it relates to all sorts of issues. Remember that our soul is the feeling part of us. Remember the, the dominant organs of the soul are not the mind of the soul, but are the emotional parts of the soul, the heart, the humility and other parts of the soul. They are the dominant parts of our soul. That, that's what controls what happens with our mind. So, so, so something might enter our mind externally. So you might tell me a truth about the universe, but while I have an emotion or, or feeling or belief inside of my soul that is different to that truth that you've told me, it's impossible for me to absorb it into my soul, that truth. I have to first get rid of the error. And we'll talk about that process as a separate process because that's the process or the, or the change that has to occur to the soul in order to absorb truth. This this idea or understanding of preclusion is about the state as it is right now. And, and I feel a lot of people don't understand the current state of their soul because they don't understand this basic principle. They think that what exists in their mind is the truth about what's in their soul. But this, and this is also why psychologists have come up with the concept of unconscious behaviour. What they, you know, what they call a lack of conscious behaviour or the subconscious is eventually what they've called it. The reason why we have the so-called subconscious is because our soul has a completely different idea or concept on a particular subject to what our mind does. And it's always our soul that dominates our mind. It's always our soul that dominates our actions and, our, and everything that we choose to do and even dominates our thoughts in the end. And so, so this so-called concept of subconscious has been created because of not understanding this idea of preclusion. Yeah. So for someone who wants to know what their soul condition is, yeah. like that's quite pertinent to this point, isn't it? Of course. So it's, it's to look at with 
honesty that what they're feeling and also to look at their actions. Exactly. Look at the actions and the feelings. And, and a lot of people are not very sensitive to their feelings, of course. And so probably the best course of action is to look at the actions, what, what your soul is attracting, because that will tell you the truth. And when I say what your soul is attracting, there is a law called the law of attraction that controls how things come to you from the universe. And, and what it, how, it, how it works is that the soul in a certain condition will attract certain things in order to expose its condition, whether the mind of the person believes they have that condition or not. So, so this is what I see with a lot of spiritual development on the planet. For example, if we take the average Christian, the average Christian probably thinks they believe in the Ten Commandments and believe in the commandments that I gave in the first century of you must love your God with your whole heart, your whole soul and your whole mind, the whole strength and love your neighbour as yourself, right? So they might feel that. They might think that that's what they believe. But, but the reality is as soon as a war comes along, a lot of times they're the first person to enter it. Now, particularly if their own family or their own country is being threatened. Now, if the law of loving your neighbour as yourself had truly entered their soul, they could never contemplate going to war, ever. So that tells me that the feeling of loving your neighbour as yourself has yet to be created inside of the soul. Instead, there is another feeling that's there already, which is the feeling is, I'm able to kill my brother or sister or my neighbour under certain conditions. If they threaten me, for example, um, I should kill them. If, I th if they threaten my life or they threaten the life of my family or they might you know, try to rape my partner or under certain conditions, I can kill them. That's, that's their thought. So, so, you know, that is proof, if you like. And I'm just checking my mic because I think I've turned it off. I think I've been recording all that. So anyway, sorry about that, Eagle. So that, that is proof that the actual feeling of loving your neighbour has yet to enter the soul. All that's happened is they've had the thought that they should love their neighbour and they think that in, pro, in doing what the Bible says that they've actually, they've actually honoured or obeyed that particular command. But the reality is the command itself and the desire to do so has not entered their soul because they're willing to go to war. So there's an example of how the mind might think one thing and the soul be in a completely different state. Yeah. And this idea of preclusion, we will start to understand why it's in a different state because the feeling of loving my neighbour has not entered my soul. I just have it in my mind as a thought. And this is the problem with the mind, is the mind can have both error and truth on the same subject in it at the same time, whereas the soul cannot. The soul, it's impossible to have error and truth in the soul at the same time on the same subject. And that's what the thought of preclusion is all about. The idea of preclusion is all about. We must understand that it's impossible for our soul to have the same thing in it on, different, on, on the same subject at the same time, but with different opinions. <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing if you think about it, because it, I can then go, OK, what is my real feelings? What are the real thoughts of my soul? The real thoughts of my soul is I'm willing to go, in this case we gave, I'm willing to go to war under certain circumstances. So I, the feeling of loving my neighbour as myself is definitely not in my soul. It's just a thought. It's just an intellectual or concept or idea that I'm not actually following for some reason. And once I know that, I can then start to investigate what the reason might be. But if I don't know that, I'll probably never investigate the reason. I'll probably just logically justify why I should be able to go to war and kill my brother under certain circumstances. And this is where the mind becomes totally unreasonable because the mind will justify the soul's error. And, and, and the reason why it does is because we often want to retain the error in the soul and we don't want to change our soul. To, to accept the new thing for, for emotional reasons. There's emotional reasons why we don't. Mm. 
Okay, well, you came up with another example here, sure. um, which was the, the truth was that the soul, the real me, is the pinnacle or creation of God. Right, so when a person first hears that truth, they sort of usually go, yeah, I get that, you know, we're a pretty amazing creation. Like, if you look at humanity, you know, we've got our free will, we've, none, none of the other creatures in the universe seem to have that, that we've met anyway. And then, um, you know, so we have this concept that, wow, we are the pinnacle of the creation. Well, it's pretty, we're a pretty amazing creation. But then, but. <laughs> but then they want to go out and get drunk. Exactly. And they justify getting drunk. So how does this work? Hang on a sec. We're, on one hand, we're saying we're the pinnacle of creation of God. But on the other hand, we're acting like we're not in the sense of we're harming ourselves. So if I give you more, more of a background of that, we know that when we drink alcohol, we usually, if we do it to excess, we wake up in the morning with a very, <laughs> very sore body, right, and sore head. We also know that it kills brain cells. Even a small portion of alcohol kills brain cells that if we ingest alcohol. So bearing that in mind, if we really believed we were the pinnacle of the creation of God, do you think we would drink alcohol? Probably not, right? But the fact that I desire to drink it, or you know, if a person does desire to drink it, I don't anymore, but, but the fact that somebody desires to drink it is proof that the other truth, that I am the pinnacle of the creation of God, has yet to enter my soul. It's only entered my mind. And it cannot enter my soul because something else already exists in my soul. Which, and that something else is willing to determine my actions of even killing my brain of my physical body under certain circumstances. I'm willing to take an action that results in the destruction of my brain, which is an indication that I have not yet really accepted that I am the pinnacle of the creation of God. <clears throat> yeah, there's emotions in there that they are wanting to escape from that are quite the opposite of being the pinnacle of the creation of God. Exactly, exactly. There's something inside of the soul which causes them to feel that they're not the pinnacle of the creation of God even though in their mind they think they've accepted that particular concept. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Um, there's no, do you want to go for another example? Sure. The other go. example was um, the truth is it's not loving to be violent. Mm -hmm. We sort of touched on this with the Christian thing. Yeah. And the error is I want to punch that guy in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, the average person on the planet would go like would shy away from violence under most circumstances. However, there are times when the average person on the planet feels violence is justified. Yeah, like sometimes when you're watching a movie, and um, and you think you you know I'm really loving and I wouldn't want them to be violent, and then you're like yeah go on. yeah go on go on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right. And that emotion of yeah go to get go and get them be violent now that's a, that's that's triggered something inside of the soul that's already existed in the soul. But, but, but when you think about it, the thought of I want to be loving all the time is really just a thought under those circumstances because if you have enough stimuli in a certain direction, whatever is in the soul will become the truth. And if, if the soul says, no, I'm willing to justify violence under certain circumstances, then you'll justify violence under those circumstances every single time. And even if that means somebody dies as a result of your actions, you'd still justify violence under those circumstances. And that, that is an indication that, of this preclusion concept. And that's this idea that while in my soul I have a justification of violence under certain circumstances, I am, it is impossible for me, no matter how much I exercise my mind, it's impossible for me to be loving under all of, all of those circumstances because I will use even my mind as a justification for the underlying flawed emotion in order to express that flawed emotion. So the, if once we understand this, I feel, and, and if we're talking now, if we talk a bit about love and how it affects this, if, I, if I'm going to become more loving, then I have to at some point understand that there's things inside of my soul that preclude me from becoming more loving while they exist in my soul. So I can hear the truth, and this is what we, I find ha happening a lot to people who come along to our semin seminars. They hear the truth, they like what they hear, but it's only a thought based on what they like. It's not actually entered their soul yet. 
because you put them in a situation, sometimes the very situations I describe when I'm talking to them in the seminar, and they act immediately out of harmony with love, which is an indication that the love hasn't touched their soul enough for the truth to enter their soul yet about that particular thing. And the only reason why that's occurred is because of this concept of preclusion. While an error exists in the soul on the same subject, the truth cannot enter them. So that they will not be able to change while that area stays in the soul on that subject. It's impossible for them to change. Now they can think they've changed, but that matters not. It doesn't matter at all. It's just, and this is why a lot of people go, this is why a lot of people go to the reversion to the subconscious concept. Because they go, I thought I changed, but just something happened and something flicked in me and I just went and did it anyway. You know, that's my subconscious, is it? You know, that's what my subconscious has determined. Well, no, it's what your soul's error has determined. And if you understood the soul's error, you could have released that error and it wouldn't have determined. And then, of course, once the error no longer exists in the soul, it no longer determines the course of action or conduct and it no longer determines the reasoning of your mind. It no longer determines it in the same direction. So if you talk to the average person on this planet about violence, if we get back to that example, the average person on the planet has a mind that says and justifies logically to them, they think they have logical arguments and reasons for justifying violence. Like most people on the planet feel they have a logical reason for justifying violence. If you look at the results of violence in the course of history, we can see that there's really no justification for it ever. And in fact, if you look at the results from a logical perspective, you think, wow, every single time somebody's reverted to violence, there's extra pain and suffering and probably oftentimes more violence. Every single time. It's only when somebody's forgiven that that hasn't occurred. But the logical mind of a person who has this feeling in their heart can't absorb that. They don't understand the principles of forgiveness and they will not be able to understand the principles of forgiveness until their desire in their soul of wanting under certain circumstances to be violent has left, has left them. Until it leaves them, they will continue in their own mind to justify violence, even seeing and observing the negative outcomes of such violence. It won't have an effect logically on them. So. And, and they're, in they're in denial about their own contribution, about their own feelings to what's actually happening. Totally, of course, because their, their feelings are contributing to violence, in fact. And this is why there's this statement that some people have made that violence begets violence. And, and it does. That's the reality. If I'm violent towards you, unless you are of very high development in love, you will probably want to be violent back to me. Right? And, and, and of course, people today feel no matter how high developed they are in love, they should be violent back because, that, because the original violence justifies the subsequent violence is the way they believe. But we've, we've had a record in humanity over... over Tens of thousands of years, we've had this record in humanity that every time violence has been engaged and somebody's returned with violence, that the situation has worsened, not improved. So, so we have proof and evidence that this is not true, but, but very few people on earth even accept it logically because they ha have in their soul the justification. The justification, while it remains in their soul, will determine even their logic. It will determine how they think while the justification exists. And that's the concept of preclusion. The concept of preclusion, basically, to remind everyone, is this concept that while an error exists in the soul on a certain subject at a certain time, it is impossible for the truth to exist in the soul on the same subject at the same time. The error precludes the truth from existing. By the way, the flip side is also true with preclusion, and that is while a truth exists in the soul on a certain subject at this time, it is impossible for an error to actually be felt by the same soul at the same time on the same subject. That's also a truth. So you can see that uh, this is a great thing if you think about it. If we allow the errors to be released and we absorb the truth, right, which brings us to, our, to the next point really, which we'll stop in a minute and talk about, if we allow the error to be released and we are then able to absorb the truth, then we can change and our soul can change and our reasoning will change and our logic will change. Everything will change 
as a subsequent result of understanding that basic principle. Yeah. So can you, um, can you, like you can release the error and absorb the truth. Is it possible to release a truth and absorb an error? Of course. Oh. Of course. And we'll talk about absorption in a minute oh, and okay, the possibilities that are involved. But yes, of course, this happens very frequently. For children? No, for adults on this planet. It also happens frequently. Um, under certain stimuli, and we'll talk about those particular stimuli, okay. but yes, it's certainly possible for the soul to release a truth and absorb an error. Um, but but, but uh, obviously it depends on how, how much the soul desires that truth or desires the error as to how well that occurs. Yeah. So that, that's our first topic, our topic of preclusion. And remember that preclusion is just a label for this idea or concept that while a certain error exists in the soul on a certain subject at this time, the truth will not be able to exist in the soul on the same subject. And that's what the principle of preclusion is all about. Thanks, Lily.